Does culture matter? In conclusion, I've always wanted to start this way, culture matters because we matter. I want you to go back 30 years, 30 years ago this month, 1986. Where were you? Who were you with? Were you even you? I know I see some younger faces here, right? <laughs> right? Where were you? I know where I was because of a significant event that impacted the world. I happened to be in Europe. Chernobyl. Where were you, right? Now all of a sudden you start to think where I was when I heard about that for many of you. What I want to talk about here, though, in terms of innovation and imagination with culture, I want to talk about some, some elements that, that we've experienced, what it's like in terms of innovating from the inside out, hitting some stuck spots and having those aha moments. And I especially want to talk about something that what, what we call is hidden in plain sight. I liked how Dr. Huntsman mentioned that last night. You know, it's hidden in the harbor already. It's already there. And that was our experience. But right after, in 1986, April 86, exactly 30 years ago this month, after this, this, this catastrophe, this tragedy, loss of human life and environmental um, uh, contamination, the, the International Nuclear Safety Group got together and, and really started to look at what was going on. It was not just the reactors that melted down. It was something else. And they came up with this, this term for the very first time. This is where it first started appearing into the literature, safety culture. Now we hear about it in all sorts of different ways. We hear about safety culture, safety climate, organizational culture, right? We, we hear it, it's all over. But this was the first time that it, it started to appear. And, and what they did is they started to look at some different definitions. They, they tried to come up with one definition, and there's several papers out there, and nobody's really been successful at having just one definition. But the key elements are that when we think about culture, we think about shared. It's something that we're shared together. It could be shared perceptions, shared values, shared behaviors, attitudes, right? This is, what, this is what we mean in terms of culture. We narrow that down, we bore down even more, and the area that we've been focusing on for about, for me personally, the last 30 years has been around norms. And, and simply stated, norms are really who we are, what we're about, what goes on around here, right? With, when we hear those kinds of things, we're, we're cued into, we're somehow communicating norms. Why do norms matter? Why does culture matter? Because it, the reason is because it creates a framework, a, an agreed upon framework for how we're going to view the world. What we're going to interpret, what we're going to see, and what we're not going to see. So we have, this, we have this framework, all of us have these different frameworks for the different organizations or cultures or communities that, that, that we're a part of. And, and it's a, a view of how the world works. One thing we need to keep in mind all frameworks are wrong. Or, or, or a better way of saying this might be, all frameworks are, are incomplete. They never really match the thing that, th that they're trying to, to, to point towards, right? A model, for example, of a 747 is not the 747, right? A model of community health is not community health. They all have weaknesses, but they also have some strengths and opportunities. Back in 86, after that catastrophe, I'd finished a graduate degree. I was then out, I was in Colorado, and I was, I was doing work as part of uh, inpatient um, substance abuse prevention. And so what we would do is we would then go out, this was in 1987, we'd then go out into the communities and, and do our best shot at what we called community health. And these were some of the best practices at the time. And what we would do is basically take this out into the classroom, and, and what we, the, the the state of the art or the best practices of prevention at that time were really, um, if we have an issue, if we have a problem, what, we, what do we do? And we still ask this of people. Well, you got to tell people. you got to make them aware. And indeed, we do. But it seemed to have stopped there. It's like if all we could do is educate them on the risks, then somehow health was going to happen. So we're thinking about, okay, let's take this into the classroom. And so I, that's exactly what I was doing, going out into the classroom 
And I, I had a nice little spiel. I had a, a talk. I was telling people how, how much they were at risk, and especially their generation, and here are the things. And this one young man in the back of the classroom just said, dude, that's not who we are. <laughs> this is one of those moments for me, like, I'm, okay, I'm like, okay, great. Here's a wake-up call, right? Dude, that's not who we are. He's talking about norms. He's talking about culture. And he, he didn't say it in these way, this way, but he said, your perception is not matching our reality, right? When we think about the cultural work at that time, what we were basically doing was the don't run with sharp scissors approach, right? And if they, don't, if they keep running with sharp scissors, what do we do? Well, we, we increase the funding and we yell louder at them, right? That, that was a lot of what was going on. And a lot of our best practices were really operating for what we call a deficit base, right? Somehow you lack something and I'm going to provide it, right? You, you somehow have a missing piece, I'm going to come in and provide it. But whenever we're doing that, we're somehow also communicating, hey, we're okay because we got the grant, the funding, or the degrees, and it's you that's at risk. And that never works well. And so it didn't work in the high school, so we thought we'd take it out and do some work in, in the colleges, right? I was doing this in um, colleges in Colorado and other places. I'm, I'm not the fastest learner here, right? But, but figured it might work in colleges. So what we're going to do with this issue of binge drinking is we're going to go out and really focus on all of the, the risks and the prevalence and the harm associated with binge drinking. And there were about, this was in the late 80s, and several of us were doing this. Um, many, I mean, many people across the nation were doing this. Several of us would gather, and we go, how you doing? And it's like, what's your data showing? And what we all are seeing is a common pattern. It's like, oh, didn't see that one coming, right? But somehow, we back up and we look at it now from a different lens. We see what we're promoting and what we're putting out there as normal is what people start to gravitate towards. Essentially, what we were doing was just using a fear-based approach. And since then, there's a lot of literature that talks about some of the limitations or even the, the backfiring or the iatrogenic effects of what happens with, with fear. When we promote fear and, and use that as, as our primary message, we can actually see a boomerang effect and, and, and grow the problem. Okay, now I did get the message. Now my compass is altered, right? My prevention compass, I don't know where I'm going, right? Everything I'd been trained in is deficit-based. It, it's, got, it's got this, we're okay, you're at risk, we're going to promote. And I had really good ways of scaring people or making them cry, thinking they really got the message then, right? And now I don't know what to do. I mean, everything I'd... So, again, we start looking and we start, um, we start noticing and, and back up and something starts to emerge from a, for us that's hidden in plain sight. It's there all along, but we just didn't know how to look for it. And what, what it comes down to, it sounds really simple. It is simple, but it doesn't mean it's easy. If we really want health, we need to promote health. All right? Marketing 101, if you really want to grow a brand or an idea, you're going to need to somehow invest in and, and make that more visible. Right? So here's, here's the big piece of cultural work that we focused on. It was really looking at this, this element of a norm, right? And so when we look at it, it's like we need to first ask, what's a norm? Or, okay, that dates me. I don't know about you, but it's like a place where everyone knows your name, right? Okay, okay. Anyways, we started looking. Um, it, how many people have seen this sign? It's not far from here. Oh, this is great, right? Right? What is the norm here in Rudyard, Montana? What's the norm? Nice people. Okay. What is the exception? Come on. Sore heads. What do you think if, it, whether, you know, whoever it is, um, Anderson Cooper coming in with an AC360 or Fox News, anybody coming in, what do you think they're going to focus on? What is going to be the headline? Yeah. Sore head crisis in northern Montana town, details at 10 right? That's what they're going to talk, right? What is normally happening often isn't news making. And this is really important. This is really important. On our college campuses on Monday mornings, right? There's conversations that happen in student centers. Not just here, but all across the world. 
And it's not the conversation typically that goes, dude, you're so sober this weekend. Love the way you were spaced and drinks, having water and eating non-salty foods. <laughs> That's usually not what we're hearing. There's something else being exchanged in, in the culture, even though that could be the norm and oftentimes is. So we start looking and started to understand and look at examples of norms. And Dr. Doyle, I don't know if you're, you're in here today, I know he and other sociologists and anthropologists are going to cringe at how much I'm going to simplify this. But norms for what we're going to do, just as a metric, it's above 50%. It's a norm. Below 50%, it's, it's not. Okay? So here's examples of norms. All I need you to really look at is on that left side, they're all above 50%. They're norms. Make sense? Got it. Here's what we know about normative theories. It's not just the norm that matters, but there's this gap that often exists, and it's our perception of the norm that matters. There's not always a gap. The gaps don't always go in the, the directions that we anticipate or aren't um, gathered in the way that we think with, with our data. But when we have a gap between norms and perceived norms, we have something very interesting, an incredible opportunity for, for us to, to maneuver and, and do some work. So we start asking these questions. So what causes a misperception? Are there consequences? And what can we do? Keep this in mind. Normative misperceptions we work in both ways. We overestimate or we can underestimate. And, and sometimes we're right on as, as well. Okay? What happened for us in Montana was something that had never happened before. We moved from the college campuses and started looking at young adults and saying, wow, this is wild. If, if this phenomena of misperceiving norms, especially like binge drinking norms, is happening across the nation on college campuses, we said, well, well I wonder what's happening with young adults. The Montana Department of Transportation said, we wonder too, because we're not getting the results we want just using scare tactics. Here, let's take a look. So we started and we, we conducted some surveys and looked at, at statewide young adults. And in this case, you can see that for males in that, that 18 to 24-year-old range, they're drinking three drinks on average, right? But the misperception or the perception of what's typical is twice that much. So there, there's an over-perception of the true norm. Okay. Well, we started looking at protective factors, too. So if that was a risk factor, potentially, what about protective factors? We found the same kind of thing was operating in the, in the same study. At the same time, we were, they were under-perceiving the prevalence of protections that are happening all around. Go back to my college student example. People aren't standing up and, and just saying, I, I'm, I'm sober tonight, it's Friday. Okay. You know, we're not drawing attention to the, the norm, even though that may be what's most typical. So here's what, what became important for us, is the misperceptions, what's hidden is that um, we have both risk and protections that, that are operating. This starts to get really interesting for us then, right? And often what happens is we're underestimating, excuse me, we're overestimating the risk and we're underestimating the protections with a lot of different behaviors. That, that's what we're seeing. Here was one study funded by Montana Department of Health looking at parents statewide. And we called this one, Not My Little Angel. But if you look at these, what we have are what parents, what parents are reporting that they're doing as a, as a positive protective parenting behavior and then their perceptions of what they think most other parents are doing around Montana. Across the board, it's like, yeah, we're doing all these things. We're looking at curfews, we're monitoring grades, we know when they come home. I don't think those other people do, right? Not, so it's not my little angel. I mean, we got this, but them? Uh-uh. So we start looking other places. Here's a, here's a project we have right now in Minnesota, working with 10 communities. 85% of the high school students in these 10 communities report not having any alcohol in the previous, what is it, month? Yeah. All right. However, about half of these same students think most are drinking at least monthly or more often. Why does that matter? We start running risk ratios and we see people that have the misperceptions are more likely to engage in the problematic behavior. We see this again and again and again. Right? And here's something I need to say then. It happens everywhere we're at. The communities or the students start to say, wait, wait, I, I know that you got, you know, there's decades of research, but we're different around here, okay? I just need to let you know. And so we are hearing that from these communities. We're just finishing this five-year cohort. 
But about midway through, I said, yeah, let's take a look at your data about how different you are, right? So here's, here's how different you are in your perceptions. Um, here's how different you are in, in um, your, your injunctive norm of what you'd like to do. Oh, and here's how different you are in your actual norms, right? Yeah, tell me about different here, right? Statewide in Idaho, norm, 85%, not driven a motor vehicle. Misperception, 90%, 89% think most did. Those that do are, are at greater risk. Mental health issues, stigma, suicide. We think about, okay, in the West, it's that whole individualistic thing, and that's the biggest problem. Let me say this. The true culture, 88%, most of the adults in Wyoming disagree that it's a sign of personal weakness. But that's not the conversation you hear in, 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 our, in our healthcare systems and as we're, we're talking. Across the state of West Virginia, safe sleeping, working with home visitation. Yep, the norm. Most parents in, in West Virginia um, agree in terms of the safe sleeping conditions. However, 83% don't, uh, did not accurately perceive this norm of other parents. And when you break that down and look at the home service providers, there's even a greater misperception. We, too, become carriers of the misperceptions here. And why does it matter? It matters because social norms theory is basically saying we gravitate towards that which we see as normal. That's, that, I just, in that little sentence, I said, like, here, here's 10 books to read, right? Okay. So what's the big deal? Perception is everything. Because what we perceive to be real starts to become real for us in its consequences. We focus on it. We talk about it. We essentially grow that. Read this with me very quickly, okay? Read this. According to a research study, read out loud, at Cambridge University, come on. Huh. When I say things that make us go, hmm. You know you're on the edge of, a, of an innovation or an imaginative idea when you go, hmm. Those data don't make sense, right? Hmm. That's what was happening for us. But imagine this. What if we could give, give a, a pill or could provide something in the environment? And that's what we started to do. How many people remember the Most of Us Don't Drink and Drive campaign that we were running? You probably don't realize, in correcting that norm, that we had some of these kind of outcomes in a, in a year and a half. We saw increase for, for laws supporting the reduction of blood alcohol concentration. We saw a decrease in drinking and driving. We saw an increase in protective behaviors like having designated drivers. What about most of us are tobacco-free or keep tobacco sacred? Same kind of thing. If you were living in the seven-county area where we had introduced that for that particular year compared to the other 49 counties in our state, you would have seen a 41% difference in the proportion of first-time tobacco users and teens, right? Here's another example. 70% of Wisconsinites agree, correcting a misperception here as well. Example. Parents, did you know high school students who agree that their parents feel it would be wrong for them to drink are five times less likely to drink. So what we start doing is basically communicating back actual norms to correct the misperceptions of norms and starting conversations. One conversation here is, okay, who's the 26%, right? right? We say rubbing them wrong with the right data. This is on the Navajo Nation. New Mexico. And this is what we start to see in communities. We see an increase of the accurate perception of the norms followed by an, an increase in the, the actual behaviors or, or the attitudes. That's essentially what we're seeing, is growing the campaign, changing the norm, and then, and then seeing a change of, of behavior. We're seeing it for all different types of norms now across the globe with, with different issues. And so what we're seeing is that this thing is, as the more that we look out, we're like, whoa, this thing is huge. It's prevalent. There's a lot of literature out there now talking about it. I like this book. It's on the shelf now. It's called The Small Big. If you were to Google that, they got a lot of different examples related to this, this phenomena. So here's our big ahas. Perceptions and misperceptions 
are widespread. Perceptions and misperceptions of norms are widespread. And they operate as hidden risk or hidden protective factors. What's exciting is that we can strategically come in and grow positive community norms. We have a seven-step model where we go through that every summer in July and at, at Big Sky as an institute. We've been doing that since 1988. Norms are culture. It's a big idea for us that if we could start to correct misperceptions by communicating words of health and healing and the goodness and the beauty that really already exists, there's these indigenous protective factors already operating in our, our community. But what we have to do is we have to back up as innovators and, and question our perceptions, right? Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities. What is it? It was what? Best and worst. Which is it? It's both. It's both. And we have to figure out and work with communication and strategies that allow us to, to look at both. We find that the positive already exists in the communities and cultures and organizations that we work with. And then we have this incredible opportunity to look at how to grow those solutions from the, from the inside out. And we can use positive norms data to, to challenge misperceptions and close the gap between actual and perceived norms. We can focus on the protections and what works well. And like Marketing 101, we can grow more of that. Here's a place where you could download some more uh, information. The CDC commissioned me to write a, a, a short paper on this, and you can download this paper at, at the UM Mansfield site. Thank you very much.